Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. I'm sitting down right now with author Taja Beard here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Taja, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here because you have a new book out. It's called Patience. It's in stores now. So what's the book all about? The book is about a young girl. She was around the age of 19 when she discovered she had a medical condition known as pseudo seizures. Hmm. And it's basically telling a little bit about her story and from beginning to end, she had a lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties during the process of her going through these medical conditions. And she, towards the end, found her way through it. Where did the idea for this story come from? You want me to be truthfully honest? One day, I was actually sitting in my room. I was about 25 years old. And I said, you know what? huh, I've been going through this seizure condition for about seven years. I want to write my story and maybe someone else might gain from it. Mm -hmm. Who knows who else might have gone through this experience? And why not someone like me tell my story and it might help them tell their story, you know? Exactly. Was this easy for you to write or was this difficult? In the beginning, it was honestly something I felt needed to be done. Hmm. It was like a sign that I had inside of me saying, hey, I feel like I need to tell this story to someone. Someone needs to hear about this. Hmm. Have you ever done anything like this before, written a book or published? No, this is actually my first time. And it, I was kind of scared in the beginning because hmm. You know, I didn't know really what I was getting myself into. Like, hey, you know, I don't know how to write a book. I don't even know how to even reach publishers or any of that. Mm -hmm. And one day I just said, you know what? I dreamed about doing this. I dreamed about being an author. I dreamed about having my book in stores one day. And like I said, again, no matter what struggles do you have, there's always a better outcome. Mm -hmm. Being the first time you've written a book and published anything, I can imagine this took you a long time. Was that the case? Actually, no. It took me about a year and a half. I knew what I wanted to already talk about. The scenario, the scenes, and the way the story just came together, it was practically, you know, pen and paper. Mm. I think that's my most powerful weapon is the pen and the paper, you know? I actually wrote that as a little quote in my book. That pen and paper is my most powerful weapon. Mm. Taja, can you think back to that moment when you got the first copy of Patience in your hands and you got to hold it? What was that moment like for you? I mean, you know, I was stunned. I was, I was shocked. Mm. I didn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I actually did this. You know, like I said, one day I was just sitting in my room and just said, hey, I'm going to write this story. And then next thing you know. I'm published. <laughs> it was like an amazing feeling, you know? What are the chances you'll be writing more and publishing more in the future? A hundred percent. I'm actually working on another book titled Secrets Upon Secrets No One Ever Knew, actually. Now, this one is actually telling my life story. So we go back to the beginning where it all started leading up to patience. I know that seems kind of backwards, but I thought this was the way to do it because I felt in that moment with me going through my seizures, it was something that needed to be let out right then and there. Mm. And then I said, hey, you know what? Let's go back to the beginning of where it all started before it all started and just let people know this is really what I went through. This is really what I encountered in my life. So now that you've been through this whole thing, what advice could you give to people listening right now who are authors just starting out and they want to get published too? You know, keep striving, keep pushing, never give up. 
Mm. There's moments and times when I was in the middle of writing patients that I wanted to give up. I said, ah, I can't do this. Or, ah, this doesn't sound right. Or maybe, you know, one of these agencies aren't going to take my book because maybe, you know, they just are going to be like, no, we don't want it. Or you could do better. You know, I've I've heard a few no's from a few agencies. Mm. And this was this was a hard yes. And I said, I'm going to stick with it. And I thank you guys for this opportunity. Absolutely. Just like your book says, it takes some patience. Yes, definitely. Taja Beard's book is named Patience, and you can find this everywhere, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. And it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. Taja, thank you again for coming on the show. I really admire that you're using things in your life to deal with your own things and also to reach out and help other people. So thanks again. I hope we can do this again. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it. Right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Leanna Gonzalez. Leanna, thank you for being here with me tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, I think it's fantastic. You have a new book out in stores right now. It's called Mimi's Travels to the Florida Keys. Can you tell me all about it? Sure. The book is about a little flamingo named Mimi who is trying to figure out her place in the world and to be comfortable with herself. And she was shy, so she couldn't really express herself so much. But throughout the book, she realizes that in class, they were talking about the Northern Lights, and she really wants to go to see the Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know that can't happen right away. And she went home and her father realized that her new obsession and and he thought of something else, you know, the positive, not positive reinforcement, but to give her something else to look forward to. So they went and drove to the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. And Little did she know, she she didn't realize like how beautiful the Florida Keys was. And he just prepared her that before she moves on to bigger trips and bigger things that, you know, she has to look at the details and the inside in her own backyard. So that is what the book is about. Hmm. Leanna, what kinds of readers do you think would be really into this? The goal was for children. It's for them to realize that dreams do come true and with grit and determination and and believing in oneself and God that anything is possible. So that was the goal. And also to bring awareness of autism and valuing one's uniqueness despite where you're from or race or ethics and what disability you may have or challenge. This was to focus on, you know, the message behind it was that anything is possible and dreams really do come true if you believe. That's fantastic. Leanna, where did you get the idea for this story? I knew that I wanted to do a book pretty much at the beginning of my doctorate program. I just wasn't settled on where I was going to focus on. And then since autism is very big personally to me, with my son being diagnosed, Mm. I went that route and just thought that autism would be a great message. And, you know, it's okay that People and children may have challenges, but at the end of the day, you work hard and and you accept things and and you make things happen and anything's possible. Absolutely. Was Mimi's Travels something that took you a long time to write? Not really. Uh, What took a long time was like the production and really Mm. believing myself to submit the copy. (laughs) Um, I think that was the longest, but no, it it took a couple of weeks, Mm. but not very long at all. It's just, I think it was a process of five years over really believing myself and submitting it. I think that's what took the longest. It was a big accomplishment getting it published. So what was it like when you finally got to hold it in your hands physically for the first time? It felt great. It felt great. I have to say I've been in the HR profession for a very long time, and it's taken very long to move into new roles. And I have to say with this book, the turnaround time and and them accepting, I was very much in shock. And I was thinking maybe I should have just started the author being an author from a very long time ago because <laughs> <laughs> I did so well on this. It was, it was very, it, it felt really good. It felt really good. Have you thought about further writing and publishing? I actually have two more projects that I'm working on. Once, in addition to Mimi's travel, she goes actually to another location. I'm not going to say where yet, <laughs> but she does travel. And another one is for an adult 
so yeah, I have a couple more projects. I'm working on a few projects currently. Wonderful. What would be a good piece of advice that you could give to the aspiring authors who are listening right now? They may have anxiety and a hard time submitting something or not because they're not confident. But I believe with confidence and really believing in yourself, anything is possible. You just have to go out and do it. This book, even though it took me for some time after all the, you know, accepting and really believing in myself and submitting it. I mean, that, that was the key. It's titled Mimi's Travels to the Florida Keys. It's written by Leanna Gonzalez, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find this everywhere that you shop for books like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Leanna, thanks again for stopping by the show. I had a really nice time talking with you. I did, too. Thank you so much for having me. In the midst of our efforts for racial equality, author Tyrone Jackson takes a look at it from a spiritual standpoint in his new book, Racism and White Supremacy, Deceptions of Satan. Tyrone's right here sitting down with me to talk about it now. Tyrone, welcome to the roundtable. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Can you tell me about your new book, Racism and White Supremacy, Deceptions of Satan? Well, in this time of racism that's dividing the country, I feel that there's no race superior over another. And I looked at the spiritual aspects of it, and which is, I believe, is the roots, where most people are ignorant of or just stubborn. Mm. Now, can you think back to the moment that you got the idea to sit down, write this book, and then publish it for the world? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, I've studied the Bible as frequent as I can. And at that moment, I was in the shower. And I believe the Lord spoke to me and because my direction was going elsewhere. I was trying to point out to some of the things that the black race that, you know, blame everybody else for. I believe the Lord directed me towards the spiritual roots of why one race surpassing like the invention wise and innovation wise and all the other things, why they excel more so than the other races. And if you go to the book of Deuteronomy, I believe the 28th chapter, you see the Lord. Lord himself put out some things that if you believe in him other than other gods, these blessings will come upon you. But if you turn to other gods, these curses will come upon you. And as you can see in the book, that slavery and uh, third world nations are worshiping other gods, which led them to being enslaved and so forth and so on. Tyrone, who did you write this book for? What kinds of readers do you think would be really into this? I believe the white supremacists and even the, the Muslims. Because they, they are in doctors also. Because Allah, at the end of the chapter, I'm put that Allah is, you know, he's not the same God as the God of the Bible. And when it comes to writing books, publishing books, have you ever done this before? Never. It's the first book. Oh, congratulations. Did this take you a long time to write and then jump through all those hoops when it comes to publishing? Well, because I was working at the same time and other times I was on my regular job, I had thoughts and ideas. And it took me about four years. Tyrone, so many listeners right now are authors who are just starting out. They don't have a book out yet, but they want to publish one. Uh, what advice could you give to the aspiring authors out there? I would tell them to contact as many different authors as they can and see who offers them the best you know, prices and the best resources. Tyrone, when you think about it, you have a book out there for the world. You have your message out there. What's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? Well, the most rewarding aspect be is most people will come to realize that no race is above another. Mm. It's because the people with our ancestors were in, got into false gods and so forth and so on. Tyrone, does the writing ever get tough for you? Do you ever get things like writer's block? Yes, I do. Mm. How do you get through that? Well, I have to go on the internet or to use my dictionary. Tyrone, do you have people in your life who are particularly motivational or inspirational to you? I have two. I have a niece and a nephew that, you know, they give me insight or they give me some motivation. I also have a middle sister to give me a little motivation. Mm. And when you sit down to read Tyrone, what kinds of things do you usually pick up? Things that's accurate, like the Bible mm. and things that relate to it or, you know, unbiased news. The name of the book is Racism and White Supremacy, Deceptions of Satan. This is written by Tyrone Jackson, and it's published by Fulton Books. You can find this everywhere like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, everywhere you buy books.
Tyrone, thank you again for stopping by the show. I had a good time talking with you. Thank you. Tormented Soul of an Empty Grave, Before I Knew You. This is the new book by Shannon Starr, and she's sitting down with me now to talk all about it. Shannon, thanks for joining me here tonight. Thank you for having me, Corey. Could you tell me all about this book? Yes, well, Tormented Soul of an Empty Grave and Before I Knew You is a two-in-one memoir. So it's actually two units combined in one. Hmm. And it's a memoir about my life and struggle with childhood trauma. So what persuaded you to sit down and write this story and, and tell it to the world? It couldn't have been an easy thing. It absolutely wasn't an easy thing. I was always a writer growing up. I loved to write poems and stories and things like that. Maybe about 2008, I began to write an autobiography that didn't turn out (laughs) too well. Mm. And I never got back to it until a few years ago. The urge never left me. So I just began to start writing again. Mm. Shannon, who are you speaking to here? What was your target readership? To be honest, my target readers are anybody that will pick the book up and read it, especially to those that identify with me, that have been through the things that I've been through or are going through what I went through. It could be for male or female. It could also be for educators, even those that, you know, don't have that experience with childhood trauma. So really anybody that this book can teach, anybody that this book can speak to them, can encourage them, this book is for anybody. Hmm. Shannon, you said you've always loved to write, so I'd be surprised if you didn't have more in the works. Do you have anything planned? I absolutely do. I have the third part of this series in the works, and I also have another project in the works as well. Hmm. So about how long does something like this take you to write and then put through the publishing process? Well, to be honest, Torment the Soul of an Empty Grave and Before I Knew You, it took me less than three months to write both of them. It's not long at all. It's not a traditional read. It's more like snapshots of my memories. But the material in it, the memories are really heavy. So it didn't take that long to write because it's my experience. Hmm. The publication process took a little bit longer. So it took about three years from the time that I began to write up until the time it was published. Most people find the editing stage to be the most challenging part of everything. Was that your experience? I believe so. There was a couple of twists and turns that took place, but we were able to, you know, get through that. My daughter is also very good in English and Mm. writing, so in literature. So her and I went through and edited a lot of it before I even submitted the manuscript. So the editing process didn't take as long, I think. If we had not done that, then it would have. Shannon, what does it feel like whenever you finally get that first copy in the mail? You get to hold it in your hands. What's going through your head? Oh, wow. It was just, it was really unreal. It took a couple of days for it to really sink in. I think the process kind of took away that thrill for me at first. Mm. But eventually, as I, as I begin to just think on what it took to get there and what the project actually means, then it began to hit me. And it was an overwhelming feeling. I think all of the emotions that I felt while I wrote, all of the emotions that I felt concerning my abusers, how would they feel when they pick up and read this book? I think I just felt a combination of all different types of emotions mm. at the same time. Shannon, a lot of our listeners are aspiring authors. They're just starting out. So what advice could you give them? My advice would be don't give up. Don't give up. Trust the process. Don't despise the process. A lot of times we want to go from point A to point Z, and we forget to enjoy the journey along the way because in the journey is where we have to experience all the, you know, the not so good things, the the bumps and the bruises along the way. But it's the bumps and the bruises that teach us. It's the bumps and the bruises that gives us strength. That's where our learning process is. That's where we learn things. So I would say enjoy every step of the way as much as you can. Take time to sit with yourself. Take time to sit in with your project to see exactly, you know, where you are, process what you're feeling in the moment. If you're feeling grief, if you're feeling anxious, sit down and take time to sit in with that and let that speak to you. Even journal about what you're feeling, Mm -hmm. you know, and then you'll have something to go back to later on and you can even track your growth. 
Shannon, thank you for finding the strength and courage to tell your story to the world. Her book is called Tormented Soul of an Empty Grave, Before I Knew You. It's written by Shannon Starr, and this is published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find this everywhere that you buy your books, Amazon, and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Shannon, thanks again for joining me here on the show tonight. I had such a nice time talking with you. Thank you again, Corey, for having me. I had a great time, too. The next book we're talking about says it's the P90X of real estate books. It's called I Got the Keys, and it's written by Zachary Mitchell. He's here right now with me to talk about it. Zachary, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hey, Corey. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Your book, I Got the Keys, Real Estate Recipe. Can you tell me all about it? Sure. This book, if I were a coach and real estate was a sport, then this book would be the playbook. Hmm. I have read many real estate books before entering the business 20 years ago. And I found that there was a lot of fluff in the books, a lot of motivational techniques, but there was no meat. There was no iceberg below the water mm. of information to actually get me started into being successful in the business. So I wanted to create a book that actually got down to the nitty gritty of how to be successful and the ins and outs of the business to be successful. This book is the X's and O's. I call it the X's and O's of real estate. To put it in a football perspective, I was a big sports guy. So, I, <laughs> yeah, th that's what the book is about. Mm. Zachary, were you writing this for a specific audience? I was writing this for beginners, anybody wanting to get in the real estate business, particularly first time home buyers. It's a great book for them. Mm. Wealth building, people are looking to wealth build. And anybody looking to get in the real estate business, it's a step-by-step -step process on what to do. And was this book something that took you a long time to write and then get published? It took me about two years. I've been doing real estate for the last 20 years, Corey. Mm. A lot of people ask me questions. I also worked for the tax assessor's office for about 15 years. A lot of people would ask me questions about real estate and real estate taxes. Now I can just say, hey, why don't you go buy my book and it'll <laughs> answer all your questions. So basically, I just wrote down all the questions that I would get asked and I kind of formulated it into a book. I included, you know, my ideas and ideologies, of course. That was pretty much how the book came into fruition. Yeah, it sounds like something a lot of people can definitely use. So have you ever done anything like this before? Have you ever written a book or been published? I mean, this is my first time and I'm absolutely stoked about it. I can't be more excited. I've never written a book before, but I had some help with some editors and uh, my publisher. And I think it's a really good product that people will enjoy and learn from and potentially become successful with. Mm. What are the chances that there'll be another book in your future? You'll be writing and publishing more. It's definitely in the future, being that I'm more going from a point in my life of not helping myself, but helping. I want to help others. Mm. So the best way to do that is to write information down that could help others. So I definitely see, you know, writing another book in the future, possibly concentrating more on development, major development like townhome project, new construction projects apartment buildings, you know, the commercial side. This, mm. My book is more as an introductory side to the residential side. There are some techniques that can be used in commercial as well, but my next book, I think, will be concentrated on the commercial aspect of real estate. Mm. Now, after those two years of working on your book, whenever you opened up the mailbox and there it was, the first copy of I Got the Keys, what was going through your head? Oh my gosh, Corey, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I would never in this world thought that I would have a book with my name on it. I mean, it was an undescribable feeling. You only get that feeling maybe, you know, five times in life. You know, one, my childbirth, of course, maybe a graduation from school. That kind of feeling of euphoria sets in and accomplishment sets in. So 
it's indescribable. I can't, I couldn't believe it. I was happy. I went and celebrated. I almost started <laughs> selling it as soon as I got my preliminary copy that was meant for editing. I wanted to go out and sell it right away, <laughs> but uh, I couldn't, of course. I had to wait till the process comes. So yeah, it was, it was definitely a great enjoyment seeing the book, seeing the hard copy. Zachary, what advice would you give to our listeners now who are authors just starting out? Corey, that would be just to write out your thoughts. Mm-hmm. I mean, writing a book may sound may sound hard and difficult, especially when you read books that can be anywhere from two to three pages long. I mean, my goodness, I mean, it would seem like that would be a big, big task to do. But as you just write your thoughts out and then you organize your thoughts and after a while, you compile a great bit of information And I would just encourage them to write out their thoughts and then just formulate and organize your thoughts into a book. And that's the advice I would give. The listeners should check out this book. It's called I Got the Keys, Real Estate Recipe. It's written by Zachary Mitchell and is published by Fulton Books. You can find this everywhere like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Google Play, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Zachary, thanks again for coming by the show. I had a nice time talking with you. Hey, I appreciate it, Corey. Have a great time. I enjoy my time on here. Thank you for the wonderful questions, and thank you for letting me get my book out to the public, and I wish you nothing but much success, Corey. Here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Hurtis V. Davis. Hurtis, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful you have a new book out in stores right now. It's titled Kiki and the Spider on Economics and Strategic Moves. So could you tell me all about the book? Well, the book is basically about, it introduces at entry level the environmental factors regarding people's options surrounding economical movement that can be facilitated in the people's decision to strategize their financial endeavors early on in their lives. Hmm. What sorts of reading audience did you have in mind when you were writing? The audience that I was hoping to capture were young adults, as well as adults themselves also, if they need more information on how to strategize their financial endeavors. Hmm. Curtis, it sounds like you might have seen a need in this particular audience for this sort of thing. Was that the case? Well, I, I did see a need. Early on in my young life, I wasn't really taught things like that. Mm. You know, nowadays, children are, you know, starting businesses. But, you know, in in my generation, starting businesses was something that I was thinking about. Now that I've noticed on the media that there are a lot of children who are entering into the business world. And and when I thought about the book, at first, I wasn't thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But as I hear more and more about children entering into that type of endeavor, I I thought Kiki and a Spider would be a great tool for children, mostly that are in the eighth grade and getting ready to go into, you know, high school and college. They need to learn the Constitution to graduate eighth grade. But I thought since nowadays, since children are actually, you know, introducing themselves to the business world, I thought Mm -hmm. economics would be a great tool to connect with the Constitution as they graduate. Mm -hmm. Did Kiki and the Spider take you a long time to write and then publish? No, it didn't take me very long to write it, but it did take me a while to make sure I had all the (laughs) details I needed for it to be a successful book. Mm. Have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to writing or publishing, especially children's books? Not children's books, but I have done other writings. And do you have any advice now? You know, a lot of our listeners are aspiring authors. They want to get their first book out there. What advice do you have for them? I would advise that they do a lot of research on what they're intending to write and make sure that it's filled with a lot of detail that anyone can understand. Have you given any thought to more writing and more publishing down the road? I have. I plan on writing another book. However, it's not going to be a children's book. It's going to be a more of a romance novel. Hmm. And after all the time and hard work that you put into writing and publishing, whenever that day comes, you open up the mailbox and there's that first copy in there. What is going through your head at that point? I can't believe it. I have a book out there. (laughs) (laughs) 
now that you think about it all, what's the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author and knowing that your thoughts are out there for the world? The reward that I'm getting from it all is that my name is being distributed to a a number of people, possibly the world. Mm. And I'm really happy about that. I get a chance to speak what's on my mind. Curtis, is writing generally something that comes easy to you, or do you get challenges like writer's block and things like that? I have had, you know, issues with writer's block. Mm. And that's only because it's not that I had, didn't have any ideas to come up with. It was because I wanted my ideas to be exciting, and I want them to be understood by a lot of people when I write them. So. Mm. I kind of take my time in in writing because I want it to be so exciting. Hmm. And Hurtis, when you do write, do you have a time and a place that you like to do it? Or do you just kind of write as the inspiration hits? Uh, I kind of write as the inspiration hits. (laughs) (laughs) And what do you find the most challenging part about the publishing process to be? Is it editing your work? Is it figuring out the cover? What is it for you? It's editing my work Mm. because I want to make sure that I don't remove or add too much that's possibly needed or not needed in my writings. Mm. Well, the book is titled Kiki and the Spider on Economics and Strategic Moves. The book's written by Hurtis V. Davis, and it's published by Fulton Books. You can find this everywhere, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes and Google Play and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Thank you for joining me again tonight, Hurtis. It was wonderful talking with you and finding out about Kiki and the Spider. Thank you for having me. The book I have here now is said to appeal to every member of the family. It's titled A Cowgirl Princess, and it's written by Barbara Seabright Rothfuss. Barbara's right here with me now to talk about it. Barbara, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you tell me all about A Cowgirl Princess? It's about a girl that gets a very special Christmas present at Christmas time. The whole book is based on family and how they stick together and help each other out. And it's a, about a horse farm that they had. Hmm. And Barbara, how did you get the idea for this story? Actually, it's from my past. My uncle, Matt Mallory's in the book. He uh, had a horse farm, and he had racehorses, and he sold horses to Nashville, Tennessee, to movie stars. And I started from there, from where I remember him having that horse farm and selling the horses. And then my cousin J.D., he had a racehorse, and he had a horse named Popcorn, and that's where I get the idea of Popcorn. And basically, it's all based around my childhood memories. Hmm. Barbara, have you ever written a book before, or have you ever been published? No, I have not. What persuaded you then to sit down, write this book, and seek publication? I really can't answer that. I think it was spiritual. I think it was a blessing from heaven. Was writing and publishing this a long process for you? It was kind of interesting, and I didn't know what I was in for, but I think I did pretty good. And the pictures stem from my uncle's horse farm and his hired hands and my family memories of their parents and this cowgirl. This is such a personal thing for you. What was it like for you then, Barbara, whenever that day came, the first copy, you got to hold it in your hands for the very first time? What was that like? Actually, I was stunned, shocked, and I sent a copy to my cousin, J.D., and he said that was the best present I could have ever given. Mm. So I'm glad I got the book to him before he passed away. Mm. And we have a lot of listeners right now who are just starting out. So do you have any advice that you could give them? Just go follow your heart. That's what I did. Follow my heart. Looking back over the whole experience, what's the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author? That it's strictly my family, family names and my family's in it. That was my reward, the um, family interest and togetherness. Barbara, what are the chances that there'll be a follow-up to this book or maybe some other sort of writing in the future? 
Well, actually, when I was writing it, I was inspired, and I know it would be a lot. I wanted to make a movie out of it, actually. Hmm. And whenever you sit down to read, Barbara, what kinds of things do you find yourself drawn to? Mostly spiritual books. Well, it sounds like writing might come to you pretty easy, Barbara. Do you ever encounter challenges, writer's block, things like that? No, actually, it just came to me. And I just started writing, and I just couldn't stop until I finished the book. Mm. I just kept writing and writing. These ideas just came to my head, and they were just a spiritual thing, I'm sure. What was it like working with the illustrations, such a big part of children's books? And so you've written this story, and now you have to line up the visuals with what your words say. What was that like? Yes, well, I had already had my um, images made. And I got them out of different cowboy and cowgirl books, and I made copies of them, and then I sent that in what I wanted in my book. Well, I encourage families to check this book out. It's titled A Cowgirl Princess. It's written by Barbara Seabright Rothfuss, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can find this everywhere that you shop for books like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Barbara, thank you again for stopping by the show. I had such a wonderful time talking with you. All righty, thank you. The Fruit of Gladness. This is the new book. It's in stores right now. It's written by John D. Jervie, and I'm really happy that John is sitting here with me now to talk about it. John, thanks for joining me tonight. It's a pleasure to be here today. Well, it's wonderful to see The Fruit of Gladness is out there now. Can you tell us all about it? Yes, the fruit of gladness was inspired from the Word of God out of Acts, the second chapter. And I was just looking at when there was an explosion in the first century church. Everything was predicated on the believers, no matter what they went through. They were glad based off internal joy, not based off external circumstances or the end result. And when I looked at that, the revelation came to me that that gladness brought forth certain fruits. And those seven fruits are, you know, it was exponential increase. They were consistent steadfastly in their day-to-day -day endeavors. They all had a word-based foundation. The fellowship exploded. The quality time they spent with others and enjoyed with themselves was just, you know, unbelievable. Their prayer time increased, the kind of prayer that just really changed things, moved mountains, and, you know, brought about the desires of their heart. They have favor with man and with God. And those are the seven fruits of gladness. That's what individuals will see as far as, you know, how to find internal gladness to go on that journey. And then the second half of the book, I just give some real life application on how that has blessed me finding that internal place bearing the fruits of gladness in my life. Hmm. John, what kinds of readers were you reaching out to with this? With this, the goal was to reach everyone, not a specific denomination, not a specific gender, demographic, or age, because I believe, you know, gladness and joy and happiness is something that we all need. Mm. I've been blessed and encouraged by the fact that all denominations, all ages have been purchasing the book. They've been inspired and encouraged and blessed by the book. It's for whoever is searching and looking to increase the amount of joy and gladness in their life. Was this something that took you a long time to write and then put through the publishing process? Well, not at all, because I'm actually a bishop at my local church, my local fellowship, Spirit Truth Deliverance Ministries, and I was preparing a Bible study to discuss the importance of gladness and, and bearing the fruits of gladness. Mm -hmm. You know, as I wrote it, I was preparing the lesson, and I went to bed one night, and the Holy Spirit just began to deal with me and, and inspire me, and the inspiration came that this was more than just a local Bible study. This was something that, that was meant to be a blessing to the world. So I immediately went up, and I, I transferred. I got out my bed from a Bible study to a book, and it came together within like a week or two because I had mm -hmm. all of the material. And then once I just added the real life application to it, just had a, a mini book to put together. And I truly believe it's going to encourage and bless the nations. Mm. Is this the first time you've ever done anything like this when it comes to writing or publishing? Yes, it is. It's the first book I have ever written. And, you know, I'm looking forward to continue the process now of being a new author. 
to continue to just, you know, through my writings, just to encourage and inspire anyone that reads it. Again, the second work is already, you know, underway. I won't, you know, give you any details about that right now, but mm. this has opened up other avenues and I truly have insight to what I believe the world needs in this season. And I'm just looking forward to being a part of it and a contributing factor to increasing it, the level of peace in the land. So many of our listeners right now are authors who are looking to just start out, get their first book out there. What advice would you give to them? I would absolutely encourage all of your readers to follow their passion. Once they receive the inspiration, realize that inspiration is of God. Mm. And from that point, just begin to write, believe in themselves and write with a motive and objective, not of what they can get out of it, but how can they just be a blessing to whoever may be reading their book? If they approach it with that mindset, then I truly believe that God will bless the work of their hands. Mm. John, I really appreciate you looking to bring a little bit more joy into the world. The book is called The Fruit of Gladness. It's written by John D. Jervey, and it's published by Covenant Books. You can get this everywhere, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. John, thank you again for joining me here tonight. I had a great time chatting with you. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. Sitting down here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Sherry Foldish. Sherry, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's really exciting. You have a new book out in stores right now. It's called A Journey Through Grief, An Insight to Understanding Grief. Uh, can you tell me all about this? Well, the first part of the book basically tells my story, the pain that I went through during and after my husband's death. And later in the book, I touch on different areas of grief and what the average person can do to help the one that is grieving, such as pastors of churches or medical, your friends and family members don't know what to do or say, and my book will help them with that. Hmm. Sherry, what gave you the idea to write this? Well, it was funny because I started off with a journal mm. after my husband died, and every night after work, I'd get on the computer and just write all my thoughts and fears down, and then I put it in a drawer for 20 years, and I forgot all about it. And then just recently, in this past year, I looked at it again, I said, hmm, I wonder. So then I went ahead and contacted Christian Publishing. They were the ones that started the process of publishing my book. Hmm. Is it primarily those who are experiencing grief that you are reaching out to with this? Yes, primarily the book is to help widows and widowers get through everything. Hmm. The things that they are afraid of, they might think that they're losing their mind, and my book tells them, no, you're not. This is why this is happening. Mm. And also, friends and family don't know how to interact with someone who just lost a husband or a wife. Mm. And my book shows and tells what they can say, what they can do to eventually help that person in their journey to healing. Mm. And when it comes to writing and publishing, have you ever done this kind of thing before? No, I have not. Congratulations on publishing your first book. You know, certainly is a huge accomplishment. It isn't always that easy. Yes. What advice would you have now for the aspiring authors who are listening? Oh, I would say don't hold back. Follow your dreams and you'd be surprised where it will take you. And when you got that first copy and you got to hold it in your hands, what was that moment like for you? Well, after I said, wow, <laughs> and after I cried and, and then jumped up and down, mm and pinched myself, I still can't believe that I actually wrote a book. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back over the whole process of doing this, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of having this published and yourself being a published author now? Knowing that what I wrote and the words that came from my heart and my soul will help someone else that doesn't know which way to turn or what to do. Mm -hmm. And that really is what I wanted the book to be. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in your life who inspires you when it comes to your writing or your creativity? God was with me the entire time. Mm -hmm. He was there giving me thoughts. You know, he kind of nudged me every now and then. Mm. So that, that's the person that I give my thanks to every day for writing this book. Did you find yourself looking to God, maybe going to prayer in those times when maybe you were having trouble getting the words to come? Oh, yes. Very much so. 
And did you have a certain time or place that you would go to write or would you just sort of start writing whenever you felt inspired? I started to write whenever I felt inspired. And at the end of my book, I have included poems that I wrote, basically about grief and, and you know, what a person goes through, etc. Well, certainly my listeners should check this book out. It's titled A Journey Through Grief, An Insight to Understanding Grief. It's written by Sherry Foldish, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can pick this up everywhere like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Sherry, thank you again for joining me tonight. I had such a nice time learning about a journey through grief and a wonderful time talking with you. Thank you so much, and God bless you. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Paul Davis right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Dr. Davis, thank you so much for being here with me tonight. Well, thank you for the privilege of talking with you. It's great to have you here. I wanted to congratulate you for having a book that's out in stores right now. The title is The Bible and the Constitution. So, first of all, could you tell me what readers can expect with this? Well, first of all, they can see and be able to understand the responsibility of Christians from the Word of God to our nation, especially to the supreme civil law of our nation that is the only way that it should be run. It's called the Constitution. So what gave you the idea, the inspiration to sit down and write this and then have it published? Well, for some dumb reason, I wanted to be a notary republic. <laughs> then said, Dr. Davis, your seals in, come down to the courthouse and get it. So I went down, and first thing the lady said to me was, raise your right hand. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I've already been in the Army, and, you know, and she said, no, no, you've got to swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States. I said, well, lady, I don't know what it says. She said, oh, it don't make any difference. We don't either. I said, ma'am, this is the courthouse. She said, I understand, but it don't make any difference. I said, well, to me, it does. And I can't raise my hand to swear to do that when I don't know what it says. So I turned around and left, went back to my church office, found a copy of the Constitution, and became what Judge Earl Britt in North, in North Carolina called the most dangerous man in America because he knows the Constitution. Mm. Now, that's a sad day, but that's when it happened. What kinds of readers do you think would really be into this book? Well, every Christian should be interested because the Bible does tell us how to have a nation and how a nation should be run. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, sin is reproach on any people. Psalms 127, verse 1, except the Lord keepeth the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus was asked a question about Caesar. And his answer was, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. My question to you and every American, whether they're Christian or not, I wish they would be, whether they are or not, is who is Caesar in America? Hmm. If God says, render unto Caesar that Caesar's, number one, we have to find out who Caesar is in our nation, and what does he ask for in order to be able to give to them what is theirs, and be able to know what God asks for and we should give to him. But if I'm giving to God what belongs to Caesar, I'm wrong. If I'm giving to Caesar what belongs to God, I'm wrong. So I have to know who is Caesar and what did Caesar ask for. Mm. After a season of much study, a year or so, more than a year, when God led me to Matthew 22, 15 through 22, and studying that out, I found out that in Jesus' time, Caesar was a dictator. Well, we do not have a dictatorial form of government. We have a republic, not a democracy, which is dictator form. We have a republic. Well, what does my republic ask for? So I began studying the Constitution word for word, wrote on it. The book is written word for word of the Constitution and explaining what the words say and mean. And so when I found out that Caesar in America is a document and not a person, because everybody that takes office in America has to swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States. When I went into the Army back in the 50s, I had to do the same thing. Hmm. I didn't realize what I was doing, but I did. And so when I knew that everybody had to swear to uphold the Constitution, I quickly remembered that they are under the Constitution. And so that is the highest supreme civil law in America for every American is the Constitution. In the world, it's the Word of God. In America, for civil law, it's the Constitution. The title of the book is The Bible and the Constitution. 
It's written by Dr. Paul Davis, and this is published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can get this everywhere, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. And Dr. Davis, thank you again for joining me on the show tonight. I had a really nice time talking. God bless you, and thank you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. 